we came out. I was so tired, honestly. I couldn't hardly walk. I was so sore. Caleb was very discouraged, and I told him at the time, I said, Caleb, you know, because we prayed before we went, and I said, we've just got to trust God. I said, you know, God may use this in a way that, you know, we can't see. So we got out, and the last thing we did while we were in countless spells, we went back to Katie Harris at the TV station. And she was, you know, of course, it was a good story for her because, you know, it, it, particularly two years ago, you know, the war in Iraq was winding down and, and there was uh, probably more interest than there is now. And so she interviewed Rosalie and I together in the studio and we had more information and now we knew where Noah had been traveling. We hadn't, when I talked to her the first time, we had no idea. He could be anywhere. But now we knew that there was a good chance that he had hiked up this certain trail into the interior of this big park. The day after we had been into the Spotted Bear Ranger Station, we had an appointment the next morning with Detective Pat Walsh, and he was going to show us mm. some things that had been found that were Noah's, that Noah had left behind in the Hungry Horse Little Tiny Golden Inn. Mini Golden Inn. A mini Golden Inn <laughs> motel that he <laughs> launched off from, that he spent a night or two in and launched off from. He didn't have a car. Um, when he was staying there. These items had been found and put into Lost and Found at the little motel. They didn't get um, associated with Noah's case for several months after the detective went to that place that Noah charged his room to. Mm -hmm. um, and they know he had stayed there, but we still had no clear evidence that he had been on the trail. Then we talked, uh, the young ranger told me he saw somebody that he thought probably was Noah and I said probably not in my mind next morning we go we meet and he Pat Wall shows us the things that were left behind in that motel room that they were Noah's they the motel knew they were Noah's and there were three pairs of pants of different sizes um, one of them was um, army green pants. They looked military, lots of pockets, but they were not military issue. And then there were two pairs of blue jeans of, of two different waist sizes. And there was a, a like a camouflage tarp. And there were a bunch of cords to computer cords, phone cords that had to do with um, wall plugins, wasn't it? Or car it was plugins. car plugins. Car plugins, yeah, mm -hmm. for power yeah. cords. Yeah. And we when I saw those military type pants there, I realized that it was Noah that Ranger had seen the day before. And that was, it was, it just confirmed it that much more. It was Noah. He went into the Blue Lakes mm -hmm. as he rode on there. We had only supposed, we had nothing definite. Mm -hmm. So that made, a, and that made a, a connect, a direct connection mm -hmm. for us. I don't know if the detective said, well, this is conclusive. That was your son, and he did go into Spotted Bear. We had strong the suspicions, yeah. Yeah, by that time we had some evidence. Yeah. So then, then we, we go to Katie Harris, news person. Got that information out. And do the interview, yeah. So again, we left Kalispell. Knew a little bit more, but nothing really s substantive. Well, I think three days went, well, she, she ran the show, and then, um, yeah, she ran the show on the 9th. On the 12th, we got a phone call, and on the 12th, uh, a man called us named Bob Shaw, who was a hunter, and Bob Shaw said, claimed, that he had seen our son on September the 15th of 2010 that are in the middle of the day, our son had come walking into his camp, told them who he was, told them where he was trying to get to, they'd had coffee, they talked for a while, and then our son had been on his way. This was in the Bob Marshall Wilderness. Yeah. So it Again, was down south of, yeah. of the Blue Lakes by that time. Yeah. yeah, and there's a trail that goes, that swings south there into the wilderness. And, you know, we were overjoyed. And we've leaped a year. You know, we've gone from August the 25th of 2010 to September the 15th of 2011. And, well, I'm sorry, so just, no. Well, it's a year has gone by, 
But finally, we know that as of September 15th of 2010, right where NOAA is, where he's headed, what his goal is, it's taken us a year, over a year, to get that, that far. So we're overjoyed. And uh, in addition to that, he didn't know exactly when it was, and then he said, well, he said, you know, because we asked him, when was this? And he said, well, it was around the middle of September, and we said, well, you know, can you, any idea exactly what date? And he said, well, he said, I can tell you. He said, the Forest Service came by and gave me a, a ticket, and he said it was like for four or $500, so he said, I've still got it. <laughs> a wonderful, crusty old guy. He gets off the phone, not off the phone, he sets the phone down, goes, digs through his papers, finds a ticket, comes back and reads it to us. He says, there's a ticket right here. It was September the 15th of 2010. He said, it's possible that those, those ranger guys might have seen your son too because they came from the same direction he did. So we say, great. And we, uh, we get back to Deb Munklow, who was the wonderful Forest Service ranger that we talked to. She helps us locate those ranger guys. So we finally get the right person on the phone. And sure enough, early in the morning, September 15, 2010, um, the ranger, who's the head of another ranger station on the east side of this whole big complex, is on a horse at 6 a.m. in the morning with other rangers. They're doing patrol on the trail. And, uh, you know, we call him and he relays his story. We're on the trail and all of a sudden the horse is spooked and here's the guy asleep in the middle of the trail gets up, identifies himself as Noah Pippin. And we thought it was odd, uh, and he said, I didn't know what to make of it, but he said somebody who was with me who'd been in the military after Noah left, or after we left him, kind of punched me and said, military. So, and he, and we, and you know, of course, we're trying to get as much information as we can. We direct them to the Sheriff's Department, of course. And they say, and you know, by the way, they said, uh, uh, we, we ran into this family at the end of the day. We would have been ahead of Noah. It's possible that he might have seen them at the end of the day. We don't know what their names were, but I do remember, he said, I do recall that they were from Great Falls. He said it was a family. They had a couple of kids with them, a teenager and a younger kid and a husband and a wife. And he said they were right up against the Chinese wall. Now, i got to explain what the Chinese wall is. Yeah, we're back to the hands, right, Michigan. There's, um, there is an amazing feature right in the middle of this whole thing. It's right on the Continental Divide. It's about a 16-mile stretch of what's called the Chinese Wall. And if you've ever, if you're as old as I am and you remember Tarzan movies, and in Tarzan, you know, there was always the huge, mysterious escarpment way up in the sky, and the dinosaurs would be flying past it. Well, that's what the Chinese Wall is. It's 1,000 feet straight up, limestone wall runs for 16 miles, pretty much north and south. That's the Continental Divide. So, you know, how can we get a hold of these people? And, you know, we're praying and just asking for God at this point to open doors. Well, we, we know where Great Falls is. We've never been there before. So we ask around, and there is a newspaper in Great Falls, and once a week they write an article aimed at people that go camping. So we get on the phone with this gentleman, and he is very gracious and agrees to run an article saying, hey, if there's anybody remembers September 15th of 2011 along the Chinese Wall, if you're a family, if you happen to run into this guy. Sure enough, it turns out there's a family that lives in Great Falls, Vern and Danelle Kersey. They are uh, family camping on the Chinese Wall September 15th, 2011. And at the end of the day, uh, Vern is up on a hillside gathering wood with his son. Uh, uh, Donnell is down at the campsite with her daughter. Noah comes walking in. She immediately is a little bit concerned and kind of puts her gun on her lap. And he, he says to her, you know, hey, relax, I'm packing too. <laughs> and I think it kind of relaxed her a little bit. And she started engaging him, and she's a delightful, just delightful, wonderful people. She talks to him, he tells them his name, they dialogue, she urges him to stay with them, he declines. They talk about where he is, where they're going. He's bound to determine that he's got to get out of the park and that he's going to take a shortcut on the base of that Chinese wall. And so he takes off, and they, yeah, they spend a very, 
they're concerned about him. They, his the memory of him haunts them, has been haunting them. But they have had no idea in this year that he ended up missing. They don't know until that moment. So now they're really freaked out to know that he's missing. And so they cooperate with the authorities. We begin to communicate with them. And so that's where we end up in July of 2011. As Donnell explained the story, she was she was really concerned about this hulking guy that comes and he seemed to be troubled. All the three people, sets of people that saw him on the trail on September 15th said he seemed to be really troubled and um, thinking deeply about something. And uh, Danelle invited him to stay and eat a dinner meal with him. And she said, hey, we're gonna be leaving you know, tomorrow uh, you'd really actually be helping us out if you could eat up, help us eat up some of this food. We'd love to um, to have you join us. So he said, no, thank you, ma'am. Uh, she offered to show him her map and he was interested to see that. So she got out her map and showed him, you know, you may as well stay here and encamp with us tonight because you can't build a fire on this next section of the trail. It's against the rules. Um, and he said, that's okay, ma'am. I'll just sleep under a tree. And she's just desperately, her, her womanly heart, mother's Little heart, instinct, is, yeah. is trying, to, trying to get him to stay with them, um, to help them relax or whatever. And he resists all of her invitations and uh, he has not told them, but he's told the hunters earlier in the day that he intends to get out at the White River Pass. And he told Donnell, um, that's all right, ma'am. I'm, I'm not gonna take the change in the trail where it veers away from the wall. I'm gonna follow the wall where there is no trail. I'm just gonna follow it because it's the straight, straightest line between here and the White River Pass where I wanna get out. I think it'll get me out faster. And she tried to dissuade him, but he thanked her politely, but that he was determined to go the way he was planning. One thing that's good to know is that all during this time, we are praying, Rosie and I both, praying with our kids, other people praying, God, if he's alive, and we had good reason to believe he might be alive, then uh, uh, have him call us, have him, somebody run into him that knows him. If he's dead, we pray that his body would be found. And that was our continual prayer. That went on, you know, as we go through the story, we just kept praying that prayer. We realized that Noah was missing on September the 11th. Other people came forward later as a result of the investigation that had seen him on the trail as he was walking. On the 13th, he ran in, and you gotta realize we're praying like crazy because we are very concerned, you know, for the next four or five days. Uh, we find out that on the 13th, uh, he ran into a Christian man who's involved in a church and a ministry for vets in Libby, which is a little bit back further off here, but still in Montana, who talks to him, invites him, you know, hey, when you get out of the area, come and stay with us. Um, there was another gentleman who wasn't a believer, but who interacted with Noah and and I think gave him a, who was an ex-Marine, and gave him a really strong message about, hey buddy, you need to get back and get back to duty. And that may have been part of the reason why he was so motivated to go ahead and get out. Uh, and then that final day, which was probably the day before he died, um, you know, God sent three people who ultimately saw him at the beginning, the middle, and the end of the day, who, you know, told us, were able to tell us and identify, you know, give us some idea of his intentions of where he was. And so, you know, for us the lesson is God answers prayer. God is not going to make people do the right thing. He's not going to make our kids do the right thing. But as we pray, he's going to send people uh, in answer to our prayer to the people that we love and try to get them to do the right thing. And sometimes we're the people praying and sometimes somebody else's son is next to us and we need to try to reason with them and talk to them. So 
I think that's a great lesson, you know, for me, that God was, you know, God was answering our prayers. God was concerned about Noah's safety as well and, uh, and loved us and had the same heart for our son as we did. I mean, we had God's heart for him, really. So it was the correct way to say it. So I think that's important. That's important to me to realize, you know, that God was not caught unawares. He was answering our prayer when we were totally had no control over the situation whatsoever. We reached a point this year, early in the year, where we, I think, were getting really tired of trusting God, of staying on the point, of keeping the focus. And I know for me, I, I, I kind of wanted to give up. I didn't feel that I could, but there was a part of me that wanted to. And it was, I never had a peace one way or the other, whether he was dead or whether he was alive. But, um, you know, what God brought to my mind was, you know, Mike, anything you ask me for, a lot of times, not always, because I've been delivered from drug addiction, just like that. So I know that God is able to do that. But I think for most of our struggles, for most of our prayers, there is a part, and it's biblical, that we have to play in the answer. And God was saying, Mike, if there was, if it was some other great thing that you needed my help with, chances are there'd be a part for you to play. So you just got to keep, you and Rosie just have to keep putting one foot in front of the other and trust me and do what you know to do and, and just have to trust me for when that answer comes. And that was about three months ago before we really knew anything. So I just wanted to share that. So now we're back to the summer of 2011. So Josiah, we're so happy and excited in the midst of all the stress and grief and uncertainty, Josiah gets married to Ashley on August the 6th of 2011. And uh, may I say also yeah. that, you know, there's just, Mike had come to the point and he made it so clear to me to help me to, to understand, if we're going through this difficult, challenging time and we're holding the hand of Jesus because he says, that he will never leave us nor forsake us. Whatever he's going to, tribulation that he's going to have us go through on this earth, he is going to go through it with us. Mm -hmm. So we're trusting him that he he knows our pain. And Psalm 103 verse, I think it's 12 or 13 says, like as a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. And the next part was, uh, verse 14 says, I know your frame. I understand that you are but dust. And God had used that verse in my life before, um, many years before, when I just felt like I was trying so hard and failing to please God with my thoughts, my actions. I just felt so self-centered and uh, grieved before God. And these verses became even that much more special during this this trial that we were going through of our son missing and not knowing what's happened to him. And Mike made it real clear for me when, uh, and started saying it over and over again, Rosie, if we're going to go through this challenge, then let's glorify God in the mm -hmm. midst of it. There's a reason mm -hmm. that he's taking us through this. Mm -hmm. So every opportunity we have that people are drawn into this story, mm -hmm. We need to take it as an opportunity to magnify God. Mm -hmm. And he's the one that has answers. It's not a, a mystery to him. Mm -hmm. And he's choosing not to give us the answer to our mystery right now, but we're trusting him. Mm -hmm. So let's magnify the Lord every time we get a chance to in these interviews and with talking with people. Yeah. And that's where our heart is. It's, yeah. He is... It's not a surprise to him. He knew what Noah was going to do. He knows where Noah is. He knows if he's alive or dead. Um, and for some reason that his wisdom knows, he wants us to go through this and walk through it with him. Mm -hmm. Amen, that's good, sweetie. That's good. We had been contacted that summer after our return from Montana by the production company of NBC that produced TV shows for a, 
uh, a channel called Investigation Discovery. So the channel was Investigation Discovery. The show was Disappeared was the name of the show. They wanted to do, uh, because of their contacts with Montana, because people often go missing in that area, because that's, for whatever reason, people seem interested in those stories, they wanted to do a story about Noah. So we had made an agreement with them they were on a tight production schedule. <clears throat> we then made an agreement to them uh, to come three days after the wedding and shoot the show. And they showed up at 8.30 and they left at 9 o'clock. They were there for 12 and a half hours. Really neat people. Just typical, wonderful young adults. Had a great time with them and the producer was just a wonderful gal. And, and you know, we told, did our song and dance, we told our story, talked about our faith and our son. And we felt that they did a wonderful job, that they did a wonderful representation, that they let us speak our heart about our faith and our son as, you know, as, as best you might expect. So again, we were very fortunate. Um, the show itself did not air until February 27th of 2012. So there was a wait, but I think it was during that time that we set up a Facebook page called Have You Seen Noah Pippin or somewhere around that time, particularly when we had more information about where Noah had been. And Rosie, bless her heart, has been managing that and I know that has been tough for her at times. We've kind of split duties of things that we did and that was her job. And so she's been managing that for over well over a year now. In the midst of this, this trial, this challenge about our missing son, I was agonizing over, Lord, I'm sitting in front of this computer and I'm getting to the point where I just, I'm sitting here waiting for any new red mark to appear on the Facebook saying somebody has left a message or a comment. Sometimes it came in flurries. Sometimes there were all kinds of things, phone calls happening um, all at once. And then there would be lulls of no activity, no new leads. While we were in Montana and in Kalispell back in June. we again gotten out and beat the bushes and plastered posters everywhere. They'd put them on the trailheads. And after, after the filming of the show on September 15th, a Boy Scout troop back in that same basic area of the wilderness happened to see a shirt tangled in some, some bushes uh, very close to where our son was last seen. So they excitedly got back out of the wilderness, you know, the three or four days it takes to hike back out, and reported that to the sheriff's department. And one of the things that happened is when our son walked those many miles, he walked from one county to another. So really, we didn't understand that and the importance of it to begin with, because Pat Walsh in the county over here had retired. He was retiring December the 1st. But there was another county now that our son had walked into, Lewis and Clark County. And then, um, because those t-shirts were found, we got a call at the end of September from Sheriff Leo Dutton. And Sheriff Dutton said, you know, he introduced himself, and he told us that because that shirt had been found, he had become familiar with the story. And he was really, he was really, just felt driven to try to get an answer for us. We hadn't even met the man. And he said, well, he said, if you're praying people, he said, I want you to pray uh, uh, that f for a miracle and what else? For wisdom, for guidance, and for a miracle. For a miracle. So what he was doing is he was putting together, uh, it, it is illegal to take motorized vehicles into this big area of the country unless you've got a very good reason, unless somebody's life is threatened and in danger. Into the Bob Marshall Wilderness. Into the wilderness. Bob Marshall Wilderness, which is a big area. Somehow or another, he was able to wrangle permission from the, the Montana National Guard to take a 28-person crew into that wilderness with a cadaver dog. And he said, this is what I want to do. He said, it's going to take a miracle to pull it off because of all the red tape and all the opposition. And so we told him that we'd pray. Turns out he's a Christian. So we came to church, I think it was that morning. They were going to go in the next week on the 22nd. 
and you guys graciously had us come up. We shared with Pastor. You guys laid hands and prayed us and prayed for us, and we prayed for a miracle. In Montana, the helicopter goes in, drops these guys off. They get there, they set up their base camp, they start searching, and a storm, and you got to remember, this is September the 22nd, 2011. Noah was last seen September the 15th, 2010, almost a year to the day. A storm comes in over the mountains and uh, snowed. Snow, cold weather, they, strong winds, they had to hunker down in their tents. So this is the search party. The search party. They have planned this huge operation. They get flown in uh, in an unprecedented event of a helicopter for the first time since 1940, being permitted by the Forest Service to land the search party to search for our son's remains. Yeah. And, and a snowstorm comes. Yeah. And it's it was very disappointing, but they told us later that the sheriff said, "Hey guys, just turn it around for your favor. Look around where Noah, who encountered the same thing, would have searched for shelter. So get on your way and start searching." So, sometime during that period, I think it was the first day before the snowstorm hit. Ten men come walking. This there's a continental divide trail that runs from Mexico to Canada that goes right through this area because you're right on the Continental Divide. So 10 men come through. Guess what? They're from Michigan. They say hi. They saw the helicopters. They say hi to the search party. They exchange information and find out, wow, these guys are all up here looking for somebody else from Michigan, a young man from Michigan. They go on their way. At some point that day or the beginning of the next day when the search actually took place, I believe it was probably the next day, two of those 10 come back, a father and a son, and the son is 22, I think, at the time, and his insulin pump has gone out. He's at 7,000 feet. He's a diabetic, juvenile diabetic, and he's really in danger. And but it's a two-day walk. It's a two-day walk out, out, much less, you know, if you're sick. Next day, the headlines are unprecedented helicopter drop into the Bob Marshall, Michigan man saved. Young Michigan man saved. So God did a miracle. That young man's life was probably saved. You know, he probably would have died otherwise. And uh, in the search for our in the son. the search for our son. The and mother of that young man, um, she found out our contact information, I think from the sheriff, and she emailed me and said, hello, my name is Carol Latshaw, and I am so sorry for, you know, that your son was not found by this search, but I'm so thankful to God that because of your searching, them searching for your son, my son was saved. Mm -hmm. So in the intervening years since that happened, her son has graduated from Michigan State University, the same university Noah spent his last two years of university life at, and he's now doing just fine. Then there's an article that's released about Noah and the ticker. So again, we're just getting, we're rolling up on interest here publicly. October the 1st, a man who we've never met before named Mark Sundin shows up. And Mark Sundin has been, he's a writer from Missoula, Montana. He's written a couple books. He's done a num number of articles. He's kind of your basic journalist, world traveler kind of guy. And he has contacted us and we've agreed to be interviewed by him for three days. Uh, he's gathering information to write a, an article that's going to be released in a magazine called Outside Magazine that's specifically for hikers and it's aimed for people that that hike in the western United States and we're thinking, you know, what better avenue could we have than a hiker magazine of people that are in the western? Perhaps somebody has seen him on the next leg of his journey. So Mark spends three days with us, and he spends a lot of time interviewing Marines. So life goes on. It's the fall. There's another Thanksgiving. There's another Christmas. Uh, February 27th of this year, uh, we have still no answers, but the, the, uh, the national TV uh, program is released. Uh, the, um, and the title of the show was... A Soldier's Story. Yes. That was I'm, the title of the show. It's I'm on YouTube. Yeah, it's on Disappeared Investigation Discovery. It's on YouTube. You can watch it. That, that, when that program hits, we, we start again getting 
uh, calls from individuals in Missoula, Montana, saying, I saw your son, you know, this is where he was. And you can imagine the expectation that that raises. Well, we get the telephone call. Mike is gone, probably going to get the mail. So I'm in the office of our home with Josiah and Ashley, actually, was there to his wife. And this person calls. He has a, he has a Spanish accent. And he tells us his name is Miguel. He says that he has seen our son Noah just four days before in Los Angeles. And he's talking about, oh, yes, your son is a very hardworking man. And uh, yes, I saw him, but I wanted to call you because my niece has been his girlfriend down in Tijuana, Mexico. She works in a bar. And your son uh, has been her, her boyfriend. And my sister, that is my niece's mother, she wanted to know why he has been going under a different name because he, he, we discovered that his name is not what he says it is. He's a big man, he says. And I'm thinking, oh my goodness, really, could this be Noah? And he said, yes, his name is Noah, but, uh, but he, he told my niece his name was Mike. And for two weeks, this man and we um, interacted on both on the internet and on Facebook and over the telephone. He would never give <coughs> us a return telephone number we could call him at. He said, if you want to contact me, send me an email. This is my email address. Then after a while of, of interacting with him and him telling us more details all the time that we're, you know, he was spinning a story that um, Noah has kind of gone criminal criminal and that he had paid uh, a uh, corrupt official in Mexico to get a, a an illegal passport passport and um, yeah so it just this would have Noah would have had to really have changed to have done anything like this but we're thinking well he's changed anyway because he hasn't had contact with us we but I don't want to believe that he's gone dishonorable and so this guy is he tells us more and more details of the story each time he calls and he says that he has a friend named Carlos uh, who is an illegal alien in the US in Los Angeles area Carlos opened his home um, to Noah and said hey man you can you can stay at my house and that Noah was working a job in LA which didn't make a lot of sense because he's being searched for that's not a place that if you don't want to be seen you'd be living in the same place you were last seen I tried not to tell him many details of Noah um, then um, he said that his friend who had opened his home to Noah that one day Noah brought a bunch of his buddies home um, they were drunk and they were on drugs and that they stole everything out of his friend Carlos home and isn't that sad my friend Carlos is such a hard worker he's trying to support his family back in Mexico he can't go to the police because he's illegal and so oh it's so sad well we were so frustrated we wanted an address of where Noah worked or where he had seen him or where he lived and he was changing the story every time he called oh yes well first he lived in Los Angeles but I don't know exactly where. I'll try to find that out for you. I'll call you later. Then next time he called, he said, well, he moved to El Cajon, California. and He's living in a motel there. Yeah. Yeah. Because my friend kicked him out after he stole all these things from my friend. And so it was, and then he told us, and so your son now with the illegal passport that he got from the corrupt officials in Mexico, he's now up at the Canadian border and, and... <laughs> It's just the story was getting wilder and wilder. And so we, meanwhile, when we first got contacted by this guy saying he had seen Noah four days prior, we immediately called the sheriff, Leo Dutton, and said, we want you to stand down from taking going in for another search party this fall. They were going to try to do a second search, and I guess that's it. They were in the process of getting a second search together. They'd searched a four-mile squ four square area. And they were ready to go back in. And then all of a sudden, you know, tell him, Miguel called. You please know. stand down because we can't tell you the details. Because, um, but we have some reason to believe that Noah is alive. And we don't want you endangering your lives 
anymore to go in and search for him if he's alive. So mm -hmm. we can't tell you any more details. Mm -hmm. We will contact you later. Mm -hmm. And we're thinking, oh my goodness, I can't believe my son has gone dishonorable. But but if he has, I, I, I still love him. I still want to see him. Mm -hmm. I think it must have been some reaction from maybe post-traumatic stress syndrome. Although we talked about that over the years that he was in Iraq, he talked about it and he did not feel that he had PTSD. He saw lots of his buddies who had extreme conditions of PTSD and he felt like he didn't have it. He said, if there's anything mentally wrong with me, it happened before I went in the Marines, mom and dad, and then he'd chuckle. So, uh, he, so he this- He tolerated combat very well, actually, in retrospect, he did. So know. this story that this Miguel, we started getting more and more, this can't be true. And I didn't want to believe that it was true, but you believe anything to get in contact with your son. Yeah. So we finally decided, and yeah. I was prepared to fly to Los Angeles and try to follow up and go to Los Angeles. And knock Who knows doors. where and knock on hotel doors right. in El Cajon, California. And so over the course of the two weeks, finally, I said, I want to show me, are you on Facebook? He said, yes, I am, but it's all in Spanish. You wouldn't understand anything. I said, well, you'd be surprised. I, I you know, I, I'm pretty good with languages, so I would just like to see pictures of you and your family. And he said, oh, okay, well, I'll let you know. And so maybe the next day or in a couple of days, he called back and he, he said, this is my Facebook page. This is my name I go under. You know, these are my names. There are four names uh, of his Spanish name. And um, yeah, um, yeah, you can contact me on Facebook now. So, uh, so I did and um, he, he had obviously just started that Facebook page that day. I could see that. You can see what the date is that the person began. I looked at the pictures and then I made comments back to him when he called the next time and said, your wife looks so cute and your kids and I'm glad to know you a little bit. And um, and I had friended him on Facebook. So he was had access to my pictures and information as well. So then I gave Caleb the man's email address and he called me back and he said, Mom, I want you to take these steps. I want you to put the email address into the Facebook search bar and click and see what you come up with. So I did. And it took me to a completely different Facebook page that had also just been started recently of a Marine, but the photos of the Marine in the profile pictures were distant. He had his uniform on, his helmet on. You couldn't tell details of the person's face. So Caleb's point was, this guy's a scammer and you can't believe anything he says, Mom. Mm -hmm. Furthermore, the pictures of his family he showed are generic off from the, you know, the internet. Public domain. Yeah, pictures. Public this domain. guy <laughs> is trying to scam you guys. So we thanked Caleb in his very practical yes, sense. We didn't tell yeah. him any more details of what we'd been dealing with that had to do with dishonor and illegality and alien borders and such. And so then uh, we told this guy next time he communicated, you know, we've concluded if you have anything more for us, you need to go to the police. This is their telephone number. You contact them. Then we called the police back up in Montana mm -hmm. and we said, you guys, we are so sorry. We have been scammed. Mm -hmm. um, and what basically happened is we lost our opportunity to take another search party in that right. fall. Yeah. So they said, yeah, you know, there's a bunch of scammers that are Jamaican. And okay, so there must be Mexicans doing this too that do this with families with missing, missing people. people. My poor friend, he stole everything from me. I oh, see. it's so yeah. sad, you yeah. know, and to make you feel guilty that you will give him money and maybe he'll give you information. Right, yeah. So that, that, that stopped us from being able to go in for, with a search that fall. Yeah. We had to wait now all winter again. Because another dimension that we haven't mentioned is in this area, you've really only got two good months weather-wise to get in, yes. July and August, and that's about it. Anything else, you can't count on anything. Mm -hmm. So Mark Sundin, is, um, he's finished interviewing with us, and he's he is now, actually he's in Los Angeles. He's flown out to Los oh, Angeles right. to do yeah. research for this article he's writing about Noah's disappearance. Yeah. 
and to interview Noah's marine buddies out there. So he calls us, or we call him, and we say, Mark, we've just gotten contact. We can't tell you any details, but you know, we may have we may have found Noah. So, you know, this whole article you've just spent lots of money coming to us and going out to Los Angeles. Um, you better hold off. We can't tell you the details. So that was in the middle of Miguel um, talking mm. with us, and he Mark is saying, uh, "What do you mean? What do you mean?" Uh, and he's such a neat guy. He's yeah. very honorable himself. Yes, he is. And so he was just waiting on with bated breath <laughs> for hearing what was going on that we could not tell him. So, so for people that get into that situation, I mean, you've got to, regardless of the answer, you got to stick with the police. Yeah. Because there are people that will take advantage of you. So I guess that's the lesson that we learned, and it was a mistake. And praise God, we were able to determine it was a mistake and get back on the path. But it did, we did lose an opportunity there. Mm -hmm. At the same time, too, another thing that happened, because of all the articles and the publicity, the police in Missoula down here finally took us seriously. And we talk, they have, they have so many homeless people that they have a policeman, that's all he does. It's the homeless folks, it's this beat. So I spent a morning on the phone with him, sent pictures of Noah, got a call from him that afternoon. And again, we've had multiple, all during this time, sightings in Missoula, Montana. He said, Mr. Pippin, he said, I'm so sorry to call you. He said, I got off the phone with you and got on my bicycle, I'm riding down the road 10 minutes later. He said, I look over in an outdoor courtyard of a restaurant and there is your son. And he said, I walked over to him and I, you know, said, Noah Pippin. He said, the only problem is he's six foot four inches tall and he doesn't appreciate being called Noah Pippin. It was somebody that looked just like him. A little bit taller. And so that was the mystery of Missoula. And after that man was identified, we had, I don't think we had any more calls from Missoula. That's what had been happening. You know, we do have doubles, yeah. But again, as parents who are hoping for a happy outcome of a mystery, you're hanging on to anything. And Bard, I guess it's kind of funny, uh, Miguel's phone calls were positive in one way, and that's it did keep hope alive. We kept thinking, well, what if there was some little shred of truth in what Miguel had to say, you know, when he called? So another Thanksgiving, another Christmas. Uh, we get to February the 27th. The, um, the uh, Disappear. Disappeared program is released. We watch it. We, um, we are kind of f stunned at how good it was, that it did a great job of portraying who we were and who Noah was. We felt it was real fair representation. Um, and Rosie, we found hope in it. I remember you said- It was months later, you know, yeah, that after we'd six filmed- Six months away. Yeah, we'd filmed it in like August. So here it is, February, and I get to watch it for the first time. We don't have television service. So we rented, or we, we yeah, took out just we a got very cable short- for a month. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. The Super Bowl on this show. And we invited <laughs> Josiah and Ashley to come over and watch it with us. So we just, we can just hang. And I watched myself on that program. I got so much more hopeful from listening to me and watching me. It was just wonderful, lift to my spirit, because yeah. it reminded me yeah. again of what we had to hope for, what our focus was, mm, yes. and that God is an ever-present help in time of need. Yes. So it was very uplifting yes. to see that out there. And other people began seeing that disappeared program. It is still being re-shown. We have two Facebook pages that say, Have You Seen Noah Pippin? And that's the title of the of Facebook pages. And people watched that program disappeared. They're very drawn in by the story. It was so well done. Mm -hmm. And they Google to find out what has happened after the story was filmed. So we are... It, we know that it's still rolling and being rerun because just this week we got someone from India who put some a comment on the Facebook page after they watched the disappeared program and Googled and, and people from Botswana, people from South Africa, um, Serbia, yeah, oh, Eastern Europe, Eastern Poland, Europe, Hungary, yeah, yeah. Um, Western Europe too. We were getting comments from people, Scotland. Um, so it's. 
it's incredible. And the program was, we felt, was a testimony to the Lord, to our faith. So we were grateful for that. It kind of gave us a new lift of hope. There hadn't been a whole lot going on. And then we got to May, and in late April, early May, the National Magazine article was released. Then one thing that did happen as a result of the show, um, the Kerseys, if you remember the Kersey family, uh, Vern and Donnell Kersey, they comment a lot in the show, and they comment that they don't believe there's any way that Noah could have gotten out alive given the fact that he was so lightly packed. Well, our son in law enforcement kind of took offense at that, and he starts, you know, going back and trying to defend, you know, our belief that he may be alive. And they kind of, you know, halfway defending a point and halfway in a loving way said, well, why don't you come out with us? Let's go in together come, come the summer this year. And search for Noah. And search for together. Noah. We together. We invite you to come yeah, with us. Yeah. And what we don't know, what we don't know fully understand, appreciate yet, is that the Kersey family have been haunted by our son. It, it's been a year since they knew, since they had the contact with him before they find out he's missing. And when they find out that he's missing, it reignites their feelings of like, you know, we let him go. We should have, what could we have done more? And, and, and so anyway, um, so they make plans for the four of them, uh, plus their dog, to hike in to this wilderness area, you know, with grizzly bears and mountain lions and the whole deal. They're gonna go in in August. So they begin to make plans with Caleb. We say, we'll be there. We'll drive over and we'll be there when you guys are on the ground and we'll do a publicity circuit again around. Well, time goes on. The, the Outside mag Magazine article comes out and we are floored because Mark Sundin hits a home run. He writes a tremendous article that spends a lot of time with Noah's sergeant who got permanently disabled in Iraq and who's a really wonderful Christian man and Mark asks him some really hard questions and he just he just focuses right back on Jesus Christ and the person of Christ and it, for that and from a secular author in a secular magazine it doesn't get better than that and we've had a lot of comments on Facebook about that magazine so we're thrilled about that but it doesn't the mystery is still there nobody else comes forward and so I think at that point for me, that was a real concern. I thought if he made it out, surely somebody else would have seen him. But again, you know, you're trying to keep hope alive. So, you know, we we take off on August uh, the thir the thirteenth, our anniversary. We've been married 35 years. We get to Great Falls, which is over here in Montana, on the 17th. We pick up Caleb. We go to the Kersey's home. That they are just dear, wonderful people who have a sincere faith in God and that they have gone out of their way and put their own necks on the line and put themselves in the spotlight. They don't want it, we don't either, for the sake of our son. And so we go to their home, they're tremendously gracious. We, um, um, we... They have taken a week off. Vern has taken a week off yeah. from work. The, he only gets a week off every year for vacation to dedicate it to taking our Caleb in and searching, he and Donnell and their son, their thirteen-year-old by now son Trevor, uh, mm. searching the trail where Vern suspected that mm. he needed to look for Noah, because Noah told them at dusk that day that he was not going to stay on the trail. He was going to take the shortcut. He was going along the base of the Chinese Wall to get to the White River Pass, and to him that was the shortest way to get there. So they were really concerned. So Vern had an idea of where he thought Noah might have gotten to before the storm overcame him. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, they're telling us, we believe that he's dead. And we are still not totally accepting that. We think he's a Marine, yeah. he could have gotten out. So and Caleb has broken his foot good. two months earlier on his first day of trying to train to go into the wilderness with Vern and Donnell. And he and spent he's, he's, thousands of dollars to buy equipment to go in because they've told him, if you're going to go in with us, this is the real deal. We get in there, we can't get out. There's no, you can't ask for help. So he spends a lot of money to get geared up, start training, breaks his foot. 
Yep. And he has his, this equipment he's buying at each paycheck that they told him you need this, 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 and this to go in with us. He's uh, having that shipped to their house, so it's waiting there for him. So he breaks his foot and he, he learns that he'll have the cast off the day before he flies out to Great Falls to meet with them to go in on this search. So we, we pick him up from the airport. You're not good if I interject there too. In the meantime, there's one way for them to get in to efficiently get, and it's from the south here. Well, guess what? The year before, they had the biggest snow ever. The next year, it's tremendously dry and there's very little snow. So there's all kind of wildfires, big wildfires breaking out. And that trail gets closed like a week before they're supposed to hit it. It's closed, it's not expected to reopen. So here we all are, we're all converging on Montana to hook up with these people. Caleb's foot's broken and the trail is closed. And Vern and Donnell are just, they are, um, you know, they are really discouraged. They're more discouraged than we are. I mean, I think at this point, God has renewed us. We're kind of, we're in this for the long term. We're going to do whatever we can. This is God's mystery. Whenever he wants to solve it, we will. Maybe there's more that he wants us to say. And if that's what he wants, that's what we'll do. So we're kind of, we've got some wind in our sails again. So here we come. And so we pick up Caleb, sit down with him. And I think for the first time, they tell us again what it was like. And what it was like was they saw him at the end of the day. The next day they get up and there are clouds rolling over the top of the Chinese wall, over the escarpment. It's misty. Everything is moist and damp. It starts to rain and then it starts to sleet and then it starts to snow. And early in the morning the husband realized he's a very experienced camper. We got to get at a lower altitude. He packs up his family at the beginning of the day and they start heading out down to a lower altitude. As fast as they as can As fast go. as they can. The, their sun starts to get hypothermia and they keep going, pushing themselves. By the end of the day, they've dropped about 2,000 feet. They make camp, they dry out, they wake up the next day and there's six inches of snow. And I think for the first time, you know, we're beginning to get a better picture even though we've been there, we haven't really been back to the deep wilderness and we're beginning to get a picture that, man, you know, can anybody survive that? Just of the, the danger involved in that. We have a wonderful visit with them. Uh, they take us out on their boat on Sunday and we go to this beautiful area called H Holton Lake, which is on the Missouri River between Helena and Great Falls. We have a beautiful time just just the glory of nature, of God's creation. And we spend a couple more days, we start doing our PR thing, getting on TV, talking with anybody that will talk to us to get an article out, because that's why we're there. You know, we're there for Caleb to go in and the Curseys to go in and for us to do public relations and keep the story there. Meanwhile, yeah. <laughs> while yeah. Caleb was still in um, Texas um, prior to his flying up. But after we had left on Faith, Yes, he got contacted by some border patrol agents up at the northern border and uh, just north of Kalispell. And they had heard about a guy who had, went, who had gone missing. So they had been told by the detective who's now retired but who is head of search and rescue for Flathead County. He knows these guys through previous cases he's had with them, these border patrol guys at the Whitefish Border Patrol Station. He says, hey, did you guys know that you have a brother um, that, that maybe, you know, his, his brother's missing up here, a guy? So they said, uh, no, we hadn't heard about that. Tell us about it. And so he fills in the details. They get all excited, and they want to help. So they contact Caleb uh, down in Texas still, and they say, hey, you know, we want to help. What can we do? Mm -hmm. So... Um, and if I could, they have, Sheriff Dutton still wants to go in, but he has already used up a lot of PR capital and resources last year, the year before and didn't find anything. He has absolutely no evidence. There's been all kind of sightings across the country that Noah has been seen. He feels in his heart that Noah is there, but he's finding it really difficult to get the resources. So at that juncture, these guys, 
show up and say, we've got helicopters, we've got horses, we've got people. We want to help, but, you know, we need your invitation. You know, we, 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 you're the person that has the jurisdiction here, we don't. And uh, at his police department, he's getting people that are coming to him in private and saying, you shouldn't do this, you are sticking your neck out. You're not going to find anything, you're going to be in big trouble politically. And bless his heart, he is a Christian, and I think God was leading him. So he makes the decision to put it in gear. Yes, and he accepts the invitation of the, uh, or he accepts the request offer, of yeah. the, the offer of the Border Patrol to get involved. So we, <laughs> we are amazed. We pick up Caleb at the airport. We say, Caleb, wow, this is amazing how this is coming about. And looks like Vern and Donnell are not going to be able to take you in on the trail they intended to because of the wildfires. It got closed. Then a couple of days later, it got reopened, but they'd already given up on the idea. Meanwhile, the Border Patrol has gotten involved with the sheriff. They're, so they, this all comes together within a few days. We had nothing to do with it. Yep. At so, all. and some other people, I hear about, hey, there's a search going to go in for Noah Pippin. I really want to be there, too. Can I get in on this? Yeah. And we say, talk to Sheriff Dutton. Yeah. As far as we're concerned, amen. They can use your help to search. So some other people get involved too. Then the sheriff uh, invites us to, they decide they're going in on Wednesday morning. Mm, the 22nd. So on the 21st, we're at a planning meeting in a place over here called Swan Sea Lake. Lake. Swan Lake, uh, Swan Lake. And there's 15 law enforcement guys, search and rescue guys. Uh, there's a psychologist who's been profiling Noah, thinks he knows what happened to him. And we are not supposed to be there, but we get invited to the meeting. And so, you know, they, they are very frank. They say, this is a search. This is a search effort, not a rescue effort. We believe there's a good chance of suicide here, and therefore this is what we're looking for. So they get all, they, get, they plan, and the mission is the next day, and then everybody breaks out. But embedded in that group is a chaplain that's with the... Uh, the police department up in a place called Whitefish and is Larry Lauderay. And not only is he a chaplain, but he's offered his a good number of horses. His pack team. His to, pack team to the horses. effort. And uh, after everything is over, he grabs us and says, does anybody want to pray with us? So we say, man, yeah, you got the right people. So we stop. You know, there's police officers all around, and some of them come and join us, and he prays in Jesus' name. And I'll tell you, you know, at that part, I'm saying, God, you are in control of this. This is amazing. This is amazing, God. you know, that we got one of your people, because he's going to go in. He's given the free use of his horses to take these guys in. So everybody splits. We split. We go to back over here to a place called Augusta, Montana, and we find an old broken down hotel to spend the night in. <laughs> you don't need to go into any more detail. I don't need to go into any more detail. <laughs> it was quite an exciting night. So we spend the night spend there the night. and with a plan that we're going to go in the next morning. Now Caleb has had the cast off. He's got an air cast that he can remove when he wants to on his leg. But um, he's got crutches. So um, we meet him along with all the other people going in, uh, supposedly at 9 o'clock the next morning at the trailhead. And some of them had some major problems getting there across the mud. It had rained that day. The road was, it's a a 50 mile road to get yep. into the trailhead. trailhead. Where the road ends and the trail begins. So we, we, um, we get in there and uh, everybody is even up to the last minute. The border patrol guys are saying, I hope that the US Forest Service will change their minds and let us air, air get helicoptered into the site we're going to. That would save so much. And we've been depending on that we could use our air support. And up till the last minute, they were hoping that would happen. And some of them were not really, they weren't hikers. They weren't really that fit to go in and hike 20 miles to get into the site to begin the search. But they did anyway. I mean, those guys are my heroes. Mm. They just took Caleb under wing. They took, they said, I, I started to thank them and say, you know, I, I just thank you for, I'm so sorry that you couldn't get your air support to go in. And 
They said, now, don't you be sorry. It's the Forest Service that needs to apologize to you. <laughs> but in any case, you know, this is just what we're doing because Caleb is our brother and you are our family too. And they just, they were all encompassing, so sweet. One or two of those guys are Christians, very strong mm -hmm. Christians. Yeah. And they're, I guess so God was planning them amongst the Border Patrol guys. He was planning the chaplain in there who was going along to have opportunities to build more relationship with mm -hmm. the police and the Border Patrol agents that he sees all the time. That's his ministry to them. Yeah. So he considered a wonderful opportunity to take his horses in and carry their gear. And it's a good thing he was there because there was no other way they could have carried all that equipment. I mean, they, some of them were already packing 80 pound packs on their backs. Yeah, because there was no air support. Yeah. The air support didn't materialize, so without the horses. And in the midst of it all, and he, Larry has, has written this 10 page small type description from his perspective as a chaplain, the miracles just from his little five days in there that God did. One of them was a horse. The pack went haywire, the horse flops down, could have easily broken a leg and didn't because if it had broken a leg that would have been the end of the horses because he's got to take care of a, of, of a hurt horse now. And God, even little things like that miraculously kept us safe. So Vern Kearney, Kersey, Kersey has joined them. the search party too. He's asked as a civilian, could yeah. he go along? Yeah. They say, yes, we value your you know, expertise because you've hiked that area. You were the last yeah. one to see Noah. Yeah. Uh, yes, please come. So this group of 18, 19 searchers went in. Mike yeah. and I were there at the trailhead to shake each one of their hands and thank them, yeah. take a picture of each one so we could have a record. There's me with my, even taking a picture of the cab that Noah took. You know, I'm not going to miss any opportunity. I might need it later. You know, and I want to share too, I'm just thinking, there is nothing special or unique about Rosie and I. We're the most normal, uh, uh, you know, prone to mistakes and failures Christians you'd ever want to meet. But we sought God for those two years, and we believed that God was going to solve the mystery one way or the other, and we really asked that He would be glorified. And I think there's a lesson there, you know, of seeking the Lord and getting answers to life's questions. Um, you know, Jesus said, if you've got faith the size of a mustard seed, you'll say to this mountain, be ye moved up and cast into the sea, mm -hmm. and it will obey you. And I'm telling you, this was a mountain that got cast into the sea. I want to say, too, on Mike's birthday, Mike and Noah's birthdays are one week apart, so all of Noah's life. First, it's Noah's birthday on March 10, and then Mike's is seven days later on March 17. This year, uh, 2012, on Noah's birthday, I didn't feel much of any significance. You know, it's been two yeah. years. We haven't seen him. We'd hit that wall. And um, yeah. so we, we just thought of him, you know, and prayed about the situation a bit that day. But then Mike's birthday came a week later, and I just... The same God who caused the sun and the moon to stand still, that awesome, all-powerful God mm -hmm. could give us the answers that we're seeking Him for. Mm -hmm. So that morning of Mike's birthday, of March 17, I asked God, Lord, we have waited. We have waited for you to give us our answer. and You know the answer. Please, God, today give us an answer for Mike's birthday. And I didn't tell Mike what I had prayed. And the whole day goes by and we're celebrating his birthday and, and the end, uh, you know, at night it's bedtime and we go to sleep. There's been no new clues, no new leads, no answers. We wake up in the morning and Mike turns to me and he says, I had a dream. I said, really, what did you dream? And you remember the dream better than I do. <laughs> Yeah. He, told me, he said, I dreamed that we found Noah, that I found Noah. And then he was standing up, and I walk up to him, and I say, Noah. And Noah half turns around, and he says casually, hi, Dad. And then he walks away from Mike mm -hmm. with no further... In, Explanation. Yeah. Yeah. 
And I told Mike then that what I had prayed the day before mm -hmm. and that God would give us an answer. Mm -hmm. So, you know what, I'm looking at it from back now. I'm looking back at that from our day today. And we felt, I felt like God was saying uh, that Noah was alive somewhere. That's what I thought that the dream meant. Mm -hmm. And so it gave me renewed hope to trust that God, that he was alive. We still hadn't heard any evidence that he was dead. Mm -hmm. Noah said, you know, tapes going round and round in my mind. Noah said, Mom, I'm fine until the authorities, they'll let you know if there's something that's happened to me. Mm -hmm. So no authorities have made it known yet. So mm -hmm. that's, that gave me new hope. That was March 17th.